Hello everybody, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Truth first, Christianity to post-Christian country, separating the objective and factual from the subjective and traditional for the benefit of our faith walk. This is the next video in the series, breaking down the 1689 Baptist Confession, also known as the Second London Confession. You can see the playlist. We've had two, two videos going over the introduction. We did the first chapter, which was the Holy Scripture. We did the second chapter, God and the Trinity. We did the third chapter, God's Decree. We did the fourth chapter on creation. And today we're doing the fifth chapter on divine providence. Let's jump right into it. We have several articles in this chapter. Chapter 5, Article 1, God the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, upholds, directs, arranges, and governs all creatures and things from the greatest to the least by his perfectly wise and holy providence to the purpose for which they were created. He governs according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and unchangeable counsel of his own will. His providence leads to the praise and glory of his wisdom. Power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. Article 2 of chapter 5 on God's divine providence. All things come to pass unchangeably and certainly in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, who is the first cause, the primary cause. Thus, nothing happens to anyone by chance or outside of God's providence. This is important to remember because we often get in a habit, even as good Christians, of saying our prayers at the end of the day or over meals or during a special devotion time and we thank God for our jobs and we look at ourselves and we see the progress we've made and how much hard work we've done, but we fail to remember that every step we take and every success we make is God's providence in our lives. That's why it's important not to get wrapped up in things like jealousy about what others have or covetousness, because we have to trust that God is caring for us in the same way he's going to care for his other people. Yet by the same providence, God arranges all things to occur according to the nature of second causes. Here we see God is primary, but he arranges things in second causes, right? Uh, a synergy uh, in the world among created beings and creatures and life cycles and time and matter and space. And God arranges things to work inside that order. One way it can be looked at is that we are the ants in God's ant farm. And thank God he never bumps the lamp, the sun, either necessarily freely or in response to other causes, the secondary causes. Article 3. In his ordinary providence, God makes use of means, though he is free to work apart from them. Let me repeat that, because a lot of people read the scripture, and with a very legalistic view, they insist that God does X because this is what it says. But in his ordinary providence, God makes use of means, though he is free to work apart from them, beyond them, and contrary to him, at his pleasure. We must always give God room to work without getting in the way. The second we think we can speak with certainty about God, who he is and what he does, we have fallen into ego, ego, G-E-O, and we have edged God out. All right, Article 4, the almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God are so thoroughly demonstrated in his providence that his sovereign pl plan includes even the first fall and every other sinful action, both of angels and humans. Can't we say we see this play out in Genesis chapter 3? After the fall of man through Adam and Eve being tempted by the Nakash, the serpent, right? God, through his punishment, offers a solution. 
The solution won't be today, but I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. Speaking to the serpent and Eve, there will be enmity that goes on for a long time, but eventually the head of the serpent will be crushed. God provides our very salvation in the consequence given to Adam and Eve. His sovereign plan includes even the first fall and every other sinful action. God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by simple permission. Instead, God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs sinful actions. Through a complex arrangement of methods, he governs sinful actions to accomplish his perfectly holy purposes. A good example of this would be God's use of uh, Persian kings and Babylonian kings. Look at the interactions between David and the Babylonian kings. Look at the book of Esther and her interaction with her husband. Uh, Look at Ecclesiastes and Solomon and his just brutal, honest wisdom about things and the way things are and work. Um, So we certainly see that God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs sinful actions. Through a complex arrangement of methods, he governs sinful action to accomplish his perfect holy purposes. Yet he does this in such a way that the sinfulness of their acts arises only from the creatures and not from God. God in his attributes is perfectly free and perfectly self-sufficient. God doesn't need us. Every act toward us by God is either just or merciful and loving, agape, sacrificial love. Because God is altogether holy and righteous, he can neither originate nor approve of sin. Uh, We've seen this written earlier in um, chapters before, right? We saw this in God's decree where it said, uh, he Let me just read it for you. In chapter 3, article 1, it says, From all eternity God decreed everything that occurs without reference to anything outside himself. He did this by a perfectly wise and holy counsel of his own will, and freely and unchangeably. Yet God did this in such a way that he is neither the author of sin nor has fellowship with any in their sin. Well, wait a second, you say. He has fellowship with people in their sin. Nope. Not according to Psalm 5, 5, it says you hate all who do iniquity, speaking of God. All right, moving on. We are at article 5, 5. Uh, 5 being God's divine providence. Article 5. The perfectly wise, righteous, and gracious God often allows his own children for a time to experience a variety of of temptations, and the sinfulness of their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their former sins or to make them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts so that they might be made humble. That is a perfect example of what Paul says about our pursuit of perfecting the law. Uh, Another good picture of it would be um, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, right? The famous story where the person with the big load on their back is desperately trying to climb up the mountain only to find out they cannot ever do it without God. We cannot ever accomplish the law. Listen to it again. The perfectly wise, righteous, and gracious God often allows his children for a time to experience a variety of temptations and sinfulness from their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their former sin and to make them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts so that they might be humbled. What happens when we are humbled by the realization of the deceitfulness of our hearts. Then we can become poor in spirit, meek, and we are ready to be saved. What beautiful wording that gives us. He also does this to lead them to a closer and more constant dependence on him to sustain them 
to make more cautious about all future circumstances that may lead to sin and for other just and holy purposes. So whatever happens to any of his elect happens by his appointment for his glory and for their good. I do this not for me, I do this not for you, but for my own glory. All right, Article 6. God, as the righteous judge, sometimes blinds and hardens wicked and ungodly people because of their sins. He withholds his grace from them, by which they could have been enlightened in their understanding and had their hearts renewed. Not only that, but sometimes he also takes away the gifts they already had. Oh, that is terrifying. We must be mindful. God can take away the gifts we already had and expose them to situations that their corrupt natures turn into opportunities for sin. Oh, our hearts are deceitfully wicked and that is terrifying. Moreover, he gives them over to their own lusts. We read about that in the book of Romans and temptations of the world and the power of Satan so that they harden themselves in response to the same influences that God uses to soften others. We have one more article under section 5, uh, chapter 5, article 7. The providence of God in a general way includes all creatures, but in a special way it takes care of his church and arranges all things to its good. Ladies and gentlemen, I so much enjoy doing this series with you, and I'm learning a lot as we go. Here's the playlist of all the videos we've done so far with each chapter. As usual, the scriptural references to chapter 5 will be in the video description. If you want to support my work, please buy one of the books that I've written. You can get any of the Just Tell Me the Truth About Christianity series inexpensively. You can also buy the nonfiction book I wrote, Shipwrecked in the Land of King Tobacco, the First Washington Family Immigrant to America. Get them at Amazon.com slash author slash Nicholas Garrett. You can get them in paperback or for your Kindle. You can also support me on BitChute via PayPal or Bitcoin. Uh, you uh, can also make contributions via PayPal. You can also unlock chapters of audiobooks being read by becoming a patron uh, over on Patreon. Uh, and those are exclusive for Patreon supporters. You can visit me uh, at Facebook, BitChute, and Twitter at Evangelist Nick G. God bless you, and may your work today bear fruit. Thanks. <laughs>